Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. You know, if I had a recurring nightmare, it would be that I come to church and I tell you all that you could say hello to each other and none of you moves. And you just sit there, doe-eyed, looking at me. That would bother me. This doesn't bother me, in case you were wondering. What a nice problem. The people in your church really love each other. Yeah, I know, it's really tough. Although maybe spending more time during the week would help. I don't know. How are you guys doing today? Good. This is my uncomfortable beginning where I have no idea what to say. Except that we're in the book of Genesis again. You guys enjoying going through Genesis? There's so much to see, and we're about to get into a love story. The love boat. Yeah, it's, we're going into a love story. So uh, you ladies, I'm sure, are on the edge of your seat now. No, I don't see any of you on the edge of your seat. Okay, we're going to talk about a love story, and as we get into it, you're going to see it's probably a little different than your story uh, of when you met somebody you loved and got married, uh, it, it's a little different, and going through some of those differences will be, uh, I think, exciting. I wondered how to present this, because it's just a very simple story about how Isaac gets a wife. Now, I don't know if any of you troll the internet for a wife, or, you know, troll the bars for a wife, or, but here's the thing, Isaac doesn't get to pick his wife. It gets picked for him and not even by somebody who has sat down and asked him, so what are you looking for in a woman? <laughs> it's a servant who goes and fetches her, the indignity. So maybe not so much of a love story as maybe you imagine if you read novels with Fabio on the front. <laughs> but the Bible always has something to say to us and every chapter, every page points to Jesus. And it's an amazing thing how God has orchestrated the word of God to do that. And in just such a simple story as what we look at, God is trying to communicate something to us that's underneath the surface. Have you guys noticed that going through Genesis? It's more than just the narrative that you think it is. It is, trust me, it is. For those of you who aren't sure yet. So, in the last weeks, I had to put a ness in there, we looked at Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac, how the Lord had asked him to go to a mountain that he would show him, and I want you to sacrifice your only son. Very interesting language that we pick up from John 3.16, actually, way into the future. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's an amazing thing how God causes this whole dress rehearsal of the crucifixion of Jesus to occur. And you would think, my goodness, how is it that somebody who understands the Old Testament doesn't get this? Because it just seems so incredibly bizarre that God would ask a man to kill his only son, a son that he waited for, for over 25 years, God promised and promised and promised. And finally, when he's 100 years old, bingo. When you're absolutely sure that there's no way it came from you and your wife. And God made it happen. And then when he was probably in his early 30s, he says, I want you to take him up onto the mountain. And they go and he sacrifices. He takes Isaac and Isaac is willingly bound as he carries the wood up the hill, we think of Jesus carrying the cross. As he is willingly bound, we see Jesus willingly laying his life down on the cross. And one day, our heavenly father went through with it. He stops Abraham, but our heavenly father went through with it and allowed his son to be killed for you and me. And he's our sacrificial lamb. Not so with Abraham, he sees a, a ram caught in a thicket Interesting that his horns were stuck in a sticker bush because that's the very thing that Jesus wore. 
when he was on the cross. And so we see all of these pictures and shadows and types and analogies and metaphors in the scripture. Um, some people might ask if you take the Bible literally, and I tell them, no, I don't take it literally, I take it seriously. Amen. Because there are things like metaphors and similes and pictures and symbols and shadows and types all throughout the scripture. So it's not just a literal interpretation of the scripture. God is seeing t saying to us something a bit more. And so we're going to see that in the upcoming chapter. We see Sarah dies. Sarah is a representative of what class? It was quiet that day. They felt a little humiliated. I had asked the question. Sarah is the mother of the Jewish nation. She is the mother who begets Isaac and Jacob and all the way down. So she is the mother of the Jewish nation. So that is who she's the bride of Israel, if you will. So we're, we looked at how she died and how he goes into this land and he asked for a piece of land to bury his wife and he gets basically run into buying a giant piece of property for lots of money and he doesn't care. He's willing to shell it out because as far as he's concerned, he's not concerned about the dollar value of it. He's concerned about possessing and owning a piece of land in perpetuity. And it's the only piece of land that he has to buy in the, in the new area where God says, I've given you all of this. It's all yours. He actually purchases it. Sometimes you have to do things like that. Like maybe if you remember the book of Hosea, he has to marry this woman called Gomer. And God says, go marry this woman. Who's a prostitute? And I know she's a prostitute. I want you to marry her. And he's like, okay, not really my pick, you know, of the internet, but he does it. And she leaves him and goes back to prostitution. And he actually has to buy her back, his own wife. He has to pay somebody to buy her back. And God said, the whole reason I did this is to show you what my relationship is with Israel. Israel is like this prostitute that's always running around. Their hearts are going after others. And God himself pays a payment to buy us back, except so much more than money. He gives the life of his only son. And so we see all of these things throughout the scripture always point to Jesus. So when you come to a love story, you wonder, how could this point to Jesus? Well, we're going to take a look at it this week. A wife for Isaac. Isaac is in his 30s now, and his dad is getting old. He's about 140 years old. And so he's thinking, I, I'd better get Isaac taken care of, wed. All the more so because his mother died. He doesn't have a female influence in his life. I believe God has set up the family just as he wanted with one male and one female to bring up children. And it's essential that you have that. When that breaks down, when there's divorce, when there's death, when anything interrupts that, it always is a toll on the children, not to mention the parents. This is something God set up. We didn't make it up. We, you know, that's just something God did. So he's going to get a bride for Isaac. I, I so wanted to go through this whole thing and read it. By the way, this is the longest chapter in Genesis. So I better get to it. That's what you're thinking. I know. 69 verses in this thing, but it's, it's very uh, narrative. And I was wondering if I should explain it, all the pictures and types beforehand, or if I should tell you at the end so that you all go, oh. But I thought, eh, it's better that you pay attention when we go through. Abraham, we've seen, is a type of God, right? Because his only son was to be sacrificed. And so Abraham is in the place of God. So he's a picture or a type of God. We see Isaac as a picture of Jesus, the son, because he's the one who sacrificed. You guys follow so far, right? More of you understand? You do? Okay, good. I'm trying to get a rapport here. Number three, Sarah represents Israel because she is Yahweh's bride. Israel is always referred to as the bride of Yahweh, right? In the Old Testament. So that's who Sarah, but Sarah now is taken out of the way and she dies. I wonder what that means. We have this unnamed servant who is going to go and pick a girl for Isaac. Abraham doesn't do it himself. 
He doesn't send Isaac to do it himself. He sends an unnamed servant. He doesn't have a name. He's nameless, completely without identity, on purpose. He represents the Holy Spirit. His name's Eliezer, by the way, which means God is help. You know someone else who's called a helper? The Holy Spirit of God. So you might be thinking at this point, I think Pastor Dave has stretched this just a little too far. Wait till we read the story. There are 10 camels in here, which I think represent the 10 commandments. Definitely he's gone off. We'll take a look at it and you tell me. Rebecca, who is the bride of Isaac, represents the church. You guys are following me so far? Okay. And it happens to be the father's gift to the son. Did you ever think of the church as the gift of God the father to the son? Interesting, right? So I'm giving you all the answers before we take the test. So it should make it very easy for you. We run into this man named Laban, who we're going to run into a little bit later. And he is rotten to the core. Everybody go boo. Boo. Good. I'm, you're on board. I appreciate that. So we're going to read. We're going to go through and read 69 verses. So hold on tight. Open your eyes. Here we go. Now Abraham was old. Yeah, that well advanced in age. Stricken with years, it says in the King James. I like that. Stricken. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to his oldest servant in his house, who ruled over all he had, please put your hand under my thigh. That's not cool. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife or my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. My neighbors are not the right kind of people for my family. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me into the land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my land and my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. There's a couple of interesting things. Notice he says, do not take my son back there. By the way, Isaac was never there. Why does Abraham, Abraham say, don't take my son back there? It's curious. When you find things that don't fit, you should say, hmm, because the Lord has a surprise for you. And he says, I want you to do three things. Find me a wife from over there. Don't pick one from here. Don't Go back to my homeland. Make sure that it's from my family. By the way, I have a confession to make. I married my sister. How many of you married your sister? My wife is in Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, and she's my sister. And so if you want to get somebody... If you want to get somebody to marry, make sure they're in the family, okay? You people are tough today. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, who's 140 years old, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. You can understand the deep personal contact of having your hand under an aged man's thigh. You guys are really close. You're hoping that there were Altoids or Tic Tacs involved because you're very close and there's this connection and it's, you're, you're swearing an oath. And this is the way they used to do it. I don't think it's coming back. You could try. And the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed for all his master's goods were in his hand. He sounds like a powerful person in the house. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. You remember Nahor years and years ago? 
And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. By the way, this is a 500-mile trip. This isn't just going across town. And then he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. He wants kindness to whom? Abraham. To Abraham. Notice the servant doesn't give a rip about himself. Did you know the Holy Spirit never speaks of himself? He always speaks of Jesus. Amen. Do you know Jesus never points people to himself? He always points people to the Father. Don't you find that curious? Anyway. And then he said, O oh Lord God, my master Abraham will give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, there I stand by the well of water and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. We're going to learn that this prayer is not out loud. He's actually saying it in his heart. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may have a drink. And she says, drink. And I also will give your camels a drink. Let her be the one that you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So he's got a little bit of a fleece thing going on here. He's testing the Lord, saying, Lord, if this is your will, then make this thing happen, right? Now, it's not the best way to find out God's will, but they didn't have an entire 66 books like we do. And so he's praying, God, you're going to have to show me. And so I'm going to ask one of these women for a drink. And if she's the one, let her say, sure, I'll give you a drink. Complete stranger, looking dusty, came 500 miles. Odd looking person, not from around here. I'll be glad to give you a drink out of my pitcher. We'll swap spit. That's cool. But not only that, I'm going to, I'm going to, your 10 camels, I'm going to make sure that they have water. That's a pretty tall task, right? Lord, if this is the one, <laughs> let this happen. I don't know if you ask God for things like that, but so he's, he's trusting in God's providence that this is the right time, the right place, and God's going to work this out. He hasn't gotten on his GPS to find the address of any relatives, but he goes to the nearby well. And he's trusting in God's providence. Isn't that cool? Secondly, he's looking for a woman of character. Someone who has a heart for strangers. Somebody who would give a drink to a complete stranger saying, get away from me, buddy. I don't know you. Which we do in Jersey, don't we? <laughs> Not in the Church of the Living God, but in Jersey, you know, it's like, what do you want? You know, somebody says hello to you. You're like, what? You're going to rip me off? I don't have any money. What, what do you want? So he's trusting in character as a qualifier, as well as God's providence. Isn't that a good mix? It's practical and divine at the same time. And so it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebekah, who was born of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And the young woman was very beautiful to behold a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. And she said, drink Lord. And then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. She quickly, this is a person who's eager to serve. Gentlemen, you want to, if you're single looking for a woman, find one who's willing to serve. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. And then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondering at her remained silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Each one of these camels can drink up to 40 gallons of water. She's got a pitcher on her shoulder. I don't know what you can carry. I know she doesn't have a 55-gallon drum, okay? And she fills up the trough until they all were finished drinking. Ding, on full, all the way up, all 10 of them. That's an effort, wouldn't you say? That's a true commitment to showing love to a complete stranger. Don't you think? Aha, there's a good qualifier. Remember it. 
40 gallons a piece, these camels will hold. So that's 400 gallons of water she's trucking. May have been less, but you get the idea. It's a lot of water. So she's being watched. He's sitting and wondering, I wonder when she's going to quit doing this. 39, 40. He's wondering, is this the one? Would you be wondering at this point? It seems like God has answered her prayer or his prayer pretty well with her. It's interesting. She's a virgin, never been with a man. You know, that's how God views you. That's how God views the church, like a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, according to Ephesians. And so it was when the camels had finished drinking. It's a lot of water. The man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing 10 shekels of gold and said, whose daughter are you? <laughs> Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? That sounds like a come on line, doesn't it? <laughs> now, she has no idea who this guy is or what his intentions are, but he's slapping some gold on her. And so she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel. She's just giving information. She's just a fountain of knowledge. Micah's son, who bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feet enough and room to lodge. Is there no end to her kindness? And then the man bowed his head and he worshiped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. What a surprise. God did exactly what Abraham told him to do. And so the young woman ran, I bet she would, and told her mother's household these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Everybody go boo. Okay, good. You're catching on. And Laban ran out to the man by the well. Laban sees her running in and says, where'd you get the jewelry? And then she's, ah, you know, you know how, have you ever heard women twitter like a bird <laughs> or like a, like a, like a porpoise when they're excited young women? No, wrong crowd. Okay. So she's probably giving him all the lowdown and giving him all this information and giving it to him. It's interesting the the Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's interesting if she's a picture of the church and if this servant is giving gifts, it sounds a lot like the Holy Spirit. And it looks like he sealed a deal. He made a contract by paying up front. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. It says in three places in the scripture. In advance, he puts a payment in us. Anyway, you might see it, you might not. And so it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebecca saying, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man. By the way, it's his job to negotiate. And there he stood by the camels at the well. He stayed right where she left him. He didn't follow her. He was waiting for a man. And he said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. He didn't do anything. He ran right out immediately. There's a lot of boasting for nothing. Then the man came to the house and unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, speak on. This is a good servant. He says, listen, I'm not going to sit down and enjoy a meal because I got to tell you business. I'm here on business. And until I tell you, I'm not going to sit and relax. It's not about me. By the, way, by the way, the Holy Spirit never attracts attention to himself. It's always about Christ. He always, in fact, he brings to remembrance everything that Jesus said. He's always pointing to his master. He's always pointing to Jesus, like the servant. 
This guy's motivated by materialism. And we can see it flat out just in, the, in, a, in a, a cursory reading. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly and has become great. And he's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, and male and female servants and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when he was old. And to him, he was given all that he has. You remember who was going to get it if he didn't have a son? Eliezer, the eldest servant. It's interesting. Now my master made me swear saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before, before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son and my family and from my father's house. You will be clear from this oath when you arrive among my family, for if they will not give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. So he's telling him the whole story that we already read, right? That's why it's a long chapter. By the way, he mentions master 19 times in this passage. This servant is fixated on doing his master's will. So shouldn't we? Shouldn't our lips be full of the words of the scriptures? Shouldn't our heart and our attention and the conversation that we have be about the Lord Jesus Christ who came and died for us? Shouldn't that be the centric theme of our lives? I think so. He goes on with the story. And this day I came to the well and said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. And it shall come to pass that when a virgin comes out to draw water, and I say to her, please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, drink and I will draw for the camels also. Let it be her who the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, this is a silent prayer to the Lord. Nobody heard him except the Lord. There was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. He's not forgetting many details, is he? So I drank and she gave the camels a drink. And then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. This is a bold move. Try that on a woman you've never met. <laughs> and I bowed my head and I worshiped the Lord and I blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham who has led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Hey, 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 slow down. You just show up and say, yeah, I'll be taking her now. Could you imagine? Men, if you had a daughter, or if you have a daughter, how readily would you let a complete stranger come with a story and say, so let me take her? Yeah, I was lucky enough to let go of her when she had a, a, a man, like a real man, who she knew and loved, and it's hard enough to give her away, walk her down the aisle, tears in my eyes going to give her away to a total stranger? What are you, out of your mind? You understand the craziness of this, right? I understand it was the culture back then that you didn't pick your mate. Somebody else did. Makes you want to have a good relationship with your parents, don't you think? <laughs> Father, please get me a good one. You know, don't. <laughs> and dad's like, <laughs> I'm getting you back. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, notice it's not him. He's negotiating for his master. Tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right, or the right hand to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel, notice Laban's kind of taking point on this. He's the elder brother. That's his point is to negotiate. I answered and said, this thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife and the Lord, just as the Lord has spoken. Wow, that was easy. 
And it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard these words that he worshiped the Lord. Notice he's always thankful. Bowing himself to the earth. And then the servant brought out jewelry and silver and jewelry of gold and clothing and made and gave them to Rebecca. And he also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Isn't that interesting? That this emblem of the Holy Spirit comes bearing gifts. And he gives gifts to Rebecca. Like Christ has given to the church. You see why Rebecca is a picture of the church. And you see why this unnamed servant is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you don't. It's interesting, even these unbelievers are blessed because of their relationship to Rebecca. You know, in the New Testament in Corinthians, Paul says, listen, if you become a believer and your mate is not a believer and they're willing to live with you, don't get divorced. Stay with them. Do you know what the reason is he gives? Because your unsaved mate is sanctified by your presence. I'm not sure the unbelieving spouses of you folks who come here who have spouses who don't, don't appreciate the fact that you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you have a relationship with the creator of the universe. And they reap all the benefits of that, don't they? I sure hope so. And so he gives gifts not only to her, but also her family. He and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. And they arose in the morning and said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. They seem to have changed their tune. There's another version that actually says a year or 10 months, which can be read that way. So they apparently are changing their mind. Perhaps Laban's got his hand out. Like, you got any more of that jewelry? And let the young woman stay with us for a few days, at least 10. After that, she may go. And he said to them, do not hinder me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. So they're looking for a way out of this deal. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. I don't know how you can sit there so quietly. The picture of the flesh, Laban and his family don't want to let Sarah go with this man. They, they made great, you know, attestations early on, but they really, in their heart, don't want her to go with them. And the servant steps up, and I feel like he takes a step forward, and he gets in Laban's face. <laughs> he says, listen, you better let me go. This is of the Lord. Don't play with me. That was what we'd say in Jersey. And Rebecca said, I will go. There is choice on behalf of Rebecca by saying yes. It's that human element, which is part of us receiving Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. But that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. But not everyone's going to heaven, you know that. There has to be a receipt. There has to be a reception of the grace of God that we lay hold of. And if that doesn't happen, there's no hope. And I, the scripture is not a universalist uh, work. It doesn't say God came and sent his son for the whole world to be saved. It's those who believe in him. There has to be a choice when you say, I will be yours. I will go with you. And we make a choice. And we need to... We need to make sure that we confront people with that choice and remind them that it's not just a, yeah, yeah, we're all saved, we're all Christians, we're all going to heaven, right? Because that's what the world thinks. Regardless of the condition of their life, whether they're Jeffrey Dahmer or anybody else, they think, I'm in, I got a ticket. 
I don't think so. And so they went away, Rebekah, her sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands and ten thousands. That, that's a whole lot of kids. And may your descendants possess the, the gates of those who hate them. In other words, might you have victory over your enemies. And then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. She leaves with a man she just met to marry a man she's never seen. Is that the case with you? Have you yielded your heart to the Holy Spirit to be married to someone you've never met? Jesus Christ himself? Absolutely. That's why the world thinks you're crazy. It's like Rebecca. And she leaves all that she's ever known for a new life. She leaves it all behind. Can I get an amen? Have you left it all behind? Have you gone to go meet? Not yet, but the Holy Spirit's going to get you there. And she's not alone. It says that she has others with her. Notice it's not just her. People, are you taking other people with you? I sure hope you are. The unnamed servant, according to his master's word, brings the bride to Isaac. Notice Isaac doesn't go to her. She goes to him. Does that tell you the direction in which things will be occurring with us? The Spirit of God is going to call us in Thessalonians with the shout, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And it says that we're going to go meet the Lord in the air, which is a much different thing than when, the Holy, when God, Jesus Christ himself comes and puts his foot down and there's a big giant crack in the earth. That's a very different thing. That's another event. We will go to meet him just like Rebecca went to meet Isaac. Amen? Amen? Just trying to keep you in track with these pictures. Now, Isaac came from the way of Bir Lahai Roy. You remember what that means? Of course you don't. Nobody speaks that language. It sounds like Hawaiian. Bir Lahai Roy, the well of the one who sees me. You remember who was there? Ishmael's mom? Hagar. Hagar was there. She was cast out. She's crying, weeping. Oh, I, don't, I can't see my son die. And she steps away from him. And the angel of the Lord says, look over there. And oh, there's a well. That's the well where she's at. The well where the Lord sees me. Interesting. Now, Isaac came from the way of Beer Laheroi. Beer means well, by the way. And he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. And he lifted his eyes and he looked. And there, the camels were coming. Dad must have told him. And then Rebecca lifted her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. Interesting. Why is Isaac the master? I thought Abraham was the master. Notice they're equal. And so she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah and she became his wife. And he loved her. And so Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. That's the romantic part of it. But he's just laying on her, his eyes upon her for the first time. And she's just meeting him for the first time. By the way, it was proper for a woman when meeting a complete stranger to have her face veiled. Interesting story, right? Notice Sarah had to die first before Isaac got married. The picture of Israel, like 70 AD, Israel is taken out. There are lots of parallels in this passage. He's at the well of the living one that sees me. It's 
the ten camels. Interesting. I said that the ten camels are a picture of the law, a picture of the ten commandments probably. Here's a passage from the New Testament, Galatians 3, 24 and 25. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. That works. That we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. It's interesting. Before she came to Isaac, she got down off the camel. That's a picture of being free from the law before she meets Isaac. You guys picking all while I'm laying down here? This story is not just a love story about some unnamed guy who went and got a wife for Isaac. It's a story of all of, all of the church age and everything that's gone on. We see Sarah, who's a picture of the law. We see uh, she's a mother of the Jews, and Israel is taken out. In 70 AD, the temple was leveled. There is no more sacrifice for sin left. It's gone. That had to happen, and then suddenly she gets down off her camel, which represents the law, and we leave the law behind because we live by the law of love. We're made out of new stuff. We've got a new heart and a new mind, and we serve God out of love in our heart, not by the letter of the law, by the Spirit of God who is inside of us. So there are lots of parallels in here, and there was even more that I didn't talk about, and I'm sure somebody will tell me, oh, you forgot this, and I'm sure I did. She comes off the camel to meet Isaac. She goes into the tent. He goes into the tent of his mother, Sarah. Do you realize that the New Testament is founded on the Old Testament? Do you realize that all of the Jewish history is the foundation and the covering for us as believers? Because we believe in a Jewish Messiah. Sarah's tent if you will. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. It's interesting that the bride and the groom would be at the well, and the bride and the groom are going to say, come and take of the water freely. Interesting. So there's a well, Bir Lahai Roy, and there's also water in heaven, all of it paralleling. Do you, do you see the Lord is trying to tell us something? There's a time when he's going to come and take us, and the Spirit of God is going to whisk us away, and we're going to go be with the Lord. And as weird as it is to be a man and realize I'm going to get married to Jesus, I understand it. How about you? This is the love of our God. Mm -hmm.